building and also at home. It's a real joy and a delight to have you with us. Um, this morning we are in our last session on a series on prayer that we've been doing as a church family um, and we will be focusing on being with God today. So that's our area that we're, sp we're talking about today. So uh, we will open in prayer. Almighty God, from whom all thoughts of truth and peace proceed, kindle, we pray, in our hearts of all, the true love of peace, and guide with your pure and peaceable wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your kingdom may go forward, till the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And right now is a time that needs peace uh, so desperately, so let's be bearing that in mind today. So, we'll start with the worship team, and we have an extra helper today, one of our younger people. So it is fantastic to have Eva with us joining in to lead us in worship, just the way it should be, everybody all in together. Wonderful. Over to you and the band. If you'd like to stand, then we'll worship together.
Fabulous. Thank you so much, uh, Eva and band. Uh, what a wonderful way to start the morning, trusting in God, our lighthouse, who will guide us through all the challenges of life. Now, this morning, we're going to pray for our children and their leaders as they go off to their groups to learn more about God, and I'll look forward to hearing all about what they've been learning later on. So we pray together. Stretch out a hand if you've got a small child nearby. Stretch out in their direction if that helps you to pray. Um, don't have to, but it's always good, I think, for me. It helps a visual reminder that we're sending the power of the Spirit through the power of God. Father God, we thank you for our children and our young people. We praise you that we have a church that is full of life in these children. Father, we pray for your blessing upon them as they learn and grow with their groups today. We pray your blessings on their leaders. We pray for inspiration and for the still small voice of the Holy Spirit to be speaking to each one of them today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Fabulous children. So this is your uh, time to go out to your groups with your folks uh, and then we will carry on in sung worship um, now. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Lord, you hear the cry of the words we pray. Lord, you hear the cry of the child who treats it. Lord, you hear the cry of the depressed one sinking. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy. Growing mercy I receive, pouring out 
your justice roar in mighty waves across the earth. Come and whisper peace, O oh God of generous compassion. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Break the heavens, Lord. You said the poor are not forgotten. That your justice.
until your voice of hope is heard. For we see Jesus going before us to bring his kingdom on the earth. Amen. Lord, bring your kingdom here on earth to fuller and further, fuller measure. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. Um, and we've now got our uh, Bible readers. Both of them are on the worship team this morning. So we'll give them a, a moment just to, to hop over. Brilliant. Come on. Come on over. That's wonderful. Owen and Mark. That's fabulous. Thank you. Um, and then we'll go straight in. Once we've had Mark and Owen read us our words, we will go straight to Helen, who is going to be doing our preaching for us today. Helen Thorpe, thank you. The Old Testament reading is Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. New Testament reading this morning is taken from the letter of James, chapter 5, starting at verse 13. A prayer of faith. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, forgiving God, I pray that you would bless what I have prepared, that by your spirit it would break open your word to bring insight and challenge, to deepen our discipline of prayer as we wait on your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to meet Iris. She is just two. Iris has found it easy always to nap during the day, but now she's struggling. Something different is happening. You see, Iris is a twin. And from conception, she's always been with Connie. She has stories with Connie, cleans her teeth with Connie, and naps with Connie. Except now she doesn't. Connie seems not to be there, because Connie doesn't need a nap anymore during the day. And Iris is about to scream, to cry in her distress. So Iris is beginning a new season of learning that maturing in life requires a struggle with self and with absence. And I think the same is true of our life of prayer. 
As we mature in being with God, we struggle with ourselves and can lose that sense of God's presence with us. Martin Laird, an Augustinian writer on the contemplative tradition of prayer, puts it this way. Prayer matures by a process of breaking down rather than by acquisition and spiritual prowess. So the picture is rather like a Michelangelo sculpture that there has to be a chipping away, a breaking down for a deeper, more beautiful life of prayer to emerge. And this breaking down we can often experience as desolation and yet it's part of our maturing life with God. Now I'm struck by how few sermons I have heard or preached myself on this reality, this challenging reality. However, if we turn to the prayer book of the Bible, the Psalms, we find a fuller picture there of how being with God is experienced. There are so many Psalms of lament and rather a lot of breaking down evidenced in them. They reveal an, an agitated and anxious life of prayer, a sort of fragmenting and a floundering. Being with God brings struggle. Now we rarely read these scriptural prayers in their probing and transformative entirety in public worship these days. But from them, we can learn how to be with God in prayer when we are breaking down. So let's take a look at the psalm that Owen read to us, which is number 130. It's one of a collection of psalms that we know collectively as the Psalms of Ascent. These were used in a particular liturgical community probably by pilgrims who were on their way up to Jerusalem to one of the three great annual festivals of the year. And they would sing these psalms in the same way that, say, a carload of folks from St. Orcs on their way up to Spring Harvest might sing worship songs. These are prayers of pilgrims who know the presence of God and they long, they desire to be with him even more. So we may be surprised at where Psalm 130 begins. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. So it begins with a cry from the depths. Now, in the Old Testament, the deep is associated with deep waters, with chaos, and with separation from God. The psalmist doesn't tell us the particular details of his brokenness, but out of the bare bones of his innermost being, he cries out his need. And the response he longs for is to feel the Lord's presence with him. But he doesn't. Now I want to focus on two strands of response to that felt absence of the Lord in this psalm. And the first, which is what I'm going to spend most time on, is forgiveness. But there's also a strand of waiting, so there'll be a, a little postscript on waiting at the end. Forgiveness. When I was living in the Himalayan foothills back in the 1970s, the Indian monsoon caused a landslide and a fall of rocks came across a hairpin bend on the only road up to the hill station. So the whole community came out and with picks and shovels, and in my case, bare hands, 
we tried to clear those rocks. One big obstructive boulder was shifted and a way cleared, only to find, whoops, sorry to God's word, only to find that the next day another rock had come down the mountain to take its place. And so more clearing, more rock, and so it went on mercilessly. We recognised we had a serious problem. Now, the psalmist recognises that God's pilgrim people similarly have a serious problem. It's a problem no one today is comfortable mentioning, but it goes by the name of sin. If you, O Lord, kept a record of our sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you is forgiveness and therefore you are feared. Sin is this recurring obstacle to God's presence. Now please note that the psalmist doesn't go on about it. He just recognizes that it is, that sin is present and ongoing, and that it's not just for him, but for all God's people. Sin really is bad for us. It gets in the way of being with a God whose holiness is to be feared. But the holy God has made provision for our sin, forgiveness. And it's as simple as that. I have meditated on this verse in recent days, partly because I'm preaching on it, but also because I recognize that it's helping me address how to struggle with my sin, to recognize that I have a problem and to put my trust in God's solution. Sin is a big deal, but so is forgiveness. And maybe some of us think too much about the former, and some of us think too little about the latter. So if you are in the former category, someone who lives with a deep awareness of your unworthiness, of your failures and mistakes, your regrets and shame, hear and heed the psalmist this morning. He says to you, with God, there is forgiveness. In worshipping communities of various traditions, including this one, forgiveness is mediated through confession of sin and receiving of absolution in public worship, trusting in the Lord's word of forgiveness. Let me tell you about Nejmet, not his real name. He had been unfaithful to his wife. The deceit and desecration was sordid. And when the wife of this Christian couple found out, she was devastated. She made the decision to forgive him, but he could not forgive himself. His sin defined his identity, it ravaged his life, he had no peace, he was without God. Nejmet asked to make private confession with his minister and was guided through a simple form of acknowledging before God his responsibility for what he had done and he then received formal absolution. Just a short prayer. Nejmet had to deal with many ongoing consequences from his adultery, but separation from the presence of the Lord was not one of them. So if one particular sin darkens and diminishes your life, isn't going away, the power of confession and absolution 
may be the Lord's invitation to you this morning. James chapter 5, as read to us, recommends, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed, that you may be saved from your separation from God. There will be prayer ministry members at the back of church at the end of this service to pray for your inner healing. Or you may want to ask Faye or one of the clergy team about making formal private confession. Well, so much for those who think too much about sin. What about those of us who think too little about forgiveness, who take it for granted? If you go on silent retreat with the contemplative nuns at Fairacres in Oxford, you will be invited to join them in the chapel for, for some prayer each day before lunch. 30 minutes of prayer, but just one prayer. Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. With them, you will whisper that prayer many times. Do it with them for a week, and when you leave, you will know deep in your heart your access to the presence of God is through recognizing your need for forgiveness from a holy God of mercy. Sometimes I wonder if as we journey onwards with Jesus, we lose that awareness of our sinful nature and take for granted our access to his holy presence. You see, we are sinners not just from willfulness and neglect, but also from like, some kind of incapacity. Rowan Williams calls this a deeper level of sin, how we are born into a climate where somehow it is easier to say no to God's invitation to receive love than it is to say yes. In theological language, we are fallen creatures living in a fallen creation. In psychological language, we have an extraordinary inheritance of distorted desires and behaviors in our unconscious. In my old dad's language, we're just in a bad way. So we need to recognize that we are not essentially excellent people who occasionally mess up. We live out and out of a deeper level of sin. If you have read Pilgrim's Progress, you will remember that the Lord relieved John Bunyan's pilgrim of the heavy burden of sin that he carried on his back, rather like a fridge, early in the novel. And then was Pilgrim glad and lightsome. But as Christian journeyed on his Pilgrim path of discipleship, he struggled. He said to Prudence and Charity, I am weary of my inward sickness. And I recognize that I am too. I am weary of my self-justification, my self-deceit, my jealousies, my competitiveness. But this is who I am. This is who we are. Preaching to Anglican and Roman Catholic bishops recently, Justin Welby said, I come, as with all of us, a sinner, conscious of the judgment I will face. Now the psalmist knows that, feels that deeply. He feels the difference between himself and a holy God. 
Look how many times he marks that distinction by repeating the term Lord. Four times in the first three verses and another four times in the remaining verses. That awareness of his unworthiness beside the Lord gives him a healthy fear of getting too close before receiving forgiveness for sins. But the Lord's sacrificial work of forgiveness is continually clearing a way for us to be with him. With the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is redemption. Which is why our confession of sin and receipt of absolution in public worship is such an amazing provision of grace. And the undervaluing of this provision for confession is a failure to grasp the enormity of the compassion of God with the miracle of forgiveness. If we routinely deal with sin, we keep it in its place. And we keep our place with God. So let's pause and do just that. So we say together in our words of confession, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done. And we have done those things that we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may always serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And now a short postscript on waiting for the Lord. Waiting for the Lord himself, note, not waiting for answers to needs, but just waiting for the presence of the Lord. Recently, I found myself in one of those infuriating call center queues, listening to some awful canned music, which from time to time was interrupted with a recorded voice offering me website options and telling me how they valued my call. If that were true, I wanted to retort, you would have answered it a long time ago. But I didn't say anything because I knew there was nobody there. Just technology, which in due season cut me off. What I needed was to connect with a person for a customer advisor to be with me. And that meant trying again and more waiting. Could I endure more waiting? It seems that in our life of prayer, waiting for the presence of the Lord similarly can demand patience, persistence, endurance, and commitment to keep trying. 
My prayers are so often focused on my needs, or on a good day, on the needs of others. But how often do I yearn sufficiently for the presence of God himself that I am willing to wait on him? In Psalm 130, the second most repeated word is waiting. Waiting, 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 waiting for the presence of the Lord. A recurring practice that requires discipline. Now, our instant high-velocity culture encourages hurried patterns of prayer. And I think it's really hard for us to recalibrate waiting as a spiritual discipline. To understand waiting as a way of praying. To discipline myself to set aside time and personal agendas, deal firmly with distractions, and for a few minutes, just dwell on the Lord's word and wait. To practice the habit of being quiet. To learn that powerful language of silence. To wait for the Lord's presence. There is nothing to say and nothing to do other than wait. But we are to wait well. And that means enduring the absence with hope. My soul waits like night watchmen, says the psalmist. Waiting alert to the darkness whilst yearning for the coming light. His is a faithful, focused waiting with expectation, confident in the Lord's coming, just as you can be confident in the dawning of a day. Now, Adrian and I have just been guilty of binge-watching series three and four of The Crown, courtesy of some kind members of St. Altman's lending us the CDs. One episode in series four fantasizes on the encounter between the late queen and an intruder in her bedroom back in 1982. Remember the occasion? Well, I watched The Crown and then we looked up the facts. Michael Fagan did, in fact, breach the the palace fencing on two occasions. And it seems that nighttime security guards had no expectation of an intruder. And yes, on the second occasion, an alarm sensor had detected Fagan's movements. But police thought the alarm was faulty and switched it off. Essentially, the Queen was surrounded by watchmen who never expected an intruder and missed Fagan's presence. And so it can be for us in waiting for the Lord. There is a temptation to lose attention because we have such little expectation. As we wait for the Lord, we become bored, doubtful, lose heart, find something better to do with our time so that distracted, we miss or misinterpret the movement of the Spirit. Because the Lord will come and we will feel his presence. But we do not always, like the psalmist, experience God's presence as and when we would like or indeed expect in our prayer lives. So that learning how to faithfully wait is a journey into a deeper mystery of being with the Lord 
in the bewilderment of his felt absence. At the end of Psalm 130, you may have noticed that the discipline of waiting for the presence of the Lord is ongoing. But something in the psalmist's inner life has shifted. He no longer waits in the depths, but in confident hope. And having experienced a gift in the discipline of waiting for the Lord, he encourages his community to join him in intentional waiting. So what about us? Will we join him also? Let's pray. Lord, as we reflect on this psalm, teach us how to wait for you, for you alone, to be present to you, to wait on your presence with us. As we wait, Clear our vision. Give us eyes to see your great provision and hearts to receive your measureless love. In Jesus' name, amen. Alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He is my rock and my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He is my rock and my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He is my rock and my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God. 
not alone my soul waits in silence from him comes my salvation he is my rock and my fortress i shall not be greatly For God alone my soul waits in silence From him comes my salvation He is my rock and my fortress I shall not be greatly shaken Thank you to Kelly and the music group. If you are drawn to exploring waiting on the presence of the Lord, can I remind you that there is a quiet morning here at St. Altman's on March the 2nd, which is an invitation to explore together some ways of approaching waiting as a means of spiritual growth and deepening your life of prayer. And as the psalmist knew, there's something really powerful about waiting on the Lord together. We're going to continue in prayer now as Philip leads us in our intercessions. Thank you, Philip. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Our intercessions today are based around Paul's instructions in 1 Timothy chapter 2 where he writes, I urge you first of all to pray for all people. Ask, ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour. So, Father God, it saddens our hearts to see the great suffering in the world today. We bring to mind, firstly, those in our own communities and church family who find themselves in a hard place. We especially pray for those who suffer physically with illness or mentally with depression or anxiety. Lord, come breathe on these people by your Holy Spirit and bring great love, hope, joy and healing as you reveal yourself to them. Open their eyes, Lord, that they might see you. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, it disturbs us when we see world leaders embracing division instead of unity, injustice instead of justice, and war instead of peace. We lift all those in significant leadership to you. Come guide their thoughts, cover their actions and renew their minds Protect them from the influence of the realms of darkness. We pray that you would lay out new paths of righteousness in troubled nations and lands. In the words of William Temple, O oh, almighty God, the father of all humanity, turn, we pray, the hearts of all peoples and their rulers, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Peace may be established among the nations on the foundation of justice, righteousness, and truth. Through him 
who was lifted up on the cross to draw all people to himself, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And as we continue to pray for all people, almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you all poor and neglected persons whom it would be easy for us to forget, the homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Where people feel forgotten and hopeless, may you be their comfort. Where children lie abandoned or abused, may you be their protection. Where communities suffer at the hands of prejudice, may you be their shield. Help us to minister to those who are broken in body or spirit, that we might be as Christ to them, and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would turn their hearts, you would turn their hearts towards you. May they sense your presence. May they feel your power. May they know your love. May they be overwhelmed with your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, as we pray for ourselves, the words of the prayer of St. Francis seem very appropriate. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So good to pray together, isn't it? And so good to pray in general. Wonderful. Um, our children will need uh, collecting at 10 past, uh, so we've got a few minutes, um, but if we can now have the worship team back up uh, to continue with our worship together. Um, and just a quick reminder, uh, for anyone who uh, would like to receive prayer ministry, that will be happening during the last uh, song today, uh, just towards the end of the service. Thank you. If you'd like to stand, if you're able, we'll worship together. Still, my soul be still, and do not fear, the winds of change may rage to Is at your side, no longer dread the fires of unexpected sorrow. God, you are my God, and I will trust in you and not be shamed. Bye. 
Lesson lights and fleeting shadows Hold on to His ways With shields of faith Against temptation's flaming arrows
Heavenly Father, that is our prayer, that as we struggle sometimes with the words of prayer, we thank you that you intercede, you pray on our behalf, and we could be no safer than in your prayers. Amen. Amen. Now, um, welcome back, children. I hope you've had a great morning. Um, we just got a bit of church... Um, Church business, some of you uh, adults will be aware uh, that this week there has been a lot of press coverage about the Clapham uh, attacks um, and uh, sadly uh, somebody who had been a recent convert to Christianity um, undertook the attacks. Um, please could you just now listen to a statement from the Archbishop of Canterbury about that. Over the last week, it has been disappointing to see the mischaracterisation of the role of churches and faith groups in the asylum system. 
Churches up and down the country are involved in caring for vulnerable people from all backgrounds. For refugees and for those seeking asylum, we simply follow the teaching of the Bible, which is to care for the stranger. It is the job of the government to protect our borders and of the courts to judge in asylum cases. The church is called to love, mercy and to do justice. I encourage everyone to avoid irresponsible and inaccurate comments and let us not forget that at the heart of this conversation is the vulnerable, are the vulnerable people whose lives are precious in the sight of God. Following the Clapham chemical attack, and concerns raised in social media. The Diocese of Newcastle has consulted with all Anglican churches and none of them had anything to do with the suspect. Let's just quickly pray uh, for that whole situation. Heavenly Father, we pray for those involved in the Clapham attack and also for the perpetrator. Heavenly Father, as we have been focusing today, none of us are without sin. And as we repent, as we are aware of our failures, let us also be forgiving of those who also fail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so just a couple of notices. Um, today we have 333 Church this afternoon at St Paul's at 3.33. Things never stick to time, so that's, that's why it's 3.33. And that is for toddlers and primary school age children. So if you are new to the church today and would fancy getting involved in that, do come along to St Paul's this afternoon, Chester Green at 3.33. Um, and just a gentle reminder to those of you who oversee an area of ministry in the church, you will have received an email, but there is a ministry leaders meeting on Monday evening um, here at church do check your email for the details i believe it's 7 30 um, so do come on down then thanks ever so much and we'll see you uh, hopefully sometime very soon if not next week if not before thanks so much right okay so we are now doing the offertory hymn um, and which is going to be great is thy faithfulness and during that as we've said there'll be prayer ministry at the back nigel and sue will be stood there and helen and i will be going down shortly as well that's wonderful thank you Usually helps if you turn the volume up on your guitar before you start playing. Oh, 
Um, a really brilliant piece of scripture, one of my favourites, Ephesians 3. We're going to be saying it all together. If we could please have it on the screen. I think it's coming up. Okay, and when it says I, I'm going to be controversial. Can we change it to we? So every time it's I, let's just say we, because we're praying it together for each other. Okay, we pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And we pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the... It's power wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That's a way to end a service. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and uh, take us forward into the week uh, where we bring joy and light and faithfulness to the communities that we are in. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.